one thing I would say, if you don't agree with me, then just keep it to yourself. Hi, I'm David Fletcher and I've been asked to give you a talk about my five worst tanks. I'm not doing the best because that's been done before. I'm going to do the five most awful tanks we've got. Because we're doing it in the tank museum and because it's mainly British tanks in here, that's what you'll see. I can't do foreign ones because we haven't got any really awful foreign tanks in the collection. But uh, for British ones, we've got some hideous things. And I hope you all enjoy watching them, if nothing else. Now, this is my number five, and it's the British Charioteer. It was actually a post-war tank. But just so that you know, it's this yellow one on my right. Not this thing on my left, which is the AMX-13 that somebody's put in here. We've had to come into a dark and dingy corner of the VCC to see it. And you'll see that the tank itself has been shoved up against another tank here. You can't move down the side of it, you can't get behind it. And the turret's been reversed. Apart from that, it's perfect. But uh, that's just the way I want to talk about it. Now, the charioteer was built in a hurry and it was an improvisation. At the time, Major General Duncan was Director Royal Armoured Corps and he was very concerned that we would soon be at war with the Russians. He never said the Russians, but uh, since we're very rarely likely to be at war with anybody else, we assume it was the Russians. Now, he therefore decided that the, Com the Cromwell tank would have to go into action again after the Second World War, but the Cromwell had a 75 millimetre gun which wouldn't even have scratched the heavy Russian tanks. So General Duncan suggested that he wanted the 20 pounder, the new gun for, for the Centurion, and he wanted that on a Cromwell chassis. Now he went to various people like FVRDE who were the designers and told them what he wanted and left it to the technicians to design the tank and charioteer was the result. In fact, it's a horrible thing. The turret, besides being enormous, and it has to be enormous, because to give the gun any sort of elevation, you need to have it all above the level of the hull. They did enlarge the turret ring. I don't know how they did that without upsetting the tank, but they managed to enlarge the turret ring, but still not enough to get the gun to go up and down. So the turret had to be bigger so that the gun could do that. Now the turret itself would have weighed so much that it would have ruined the tank. So the turret has armour 1.5 inches thick at the front, which isn't very really much at all, but it's even worse at the sides. The sides of this turret are one inch thick. That's about 25 millimetres. It's nothing. And it means that the thing is virtually destroyable by anything that cares to fire at it. And sending it out even with a bigger gun wasn't much of an advantage because it was whatever happened, it was going to get hit and the crew were going to get killed. They'd done away with the front hull machine gunner, although they sometimes sat a man in there in supreme discomfort. And uh, otherwise it was a, a, the ordinary Cromwell chassis powered by the Rolls-Royce Meteor engine and Christie suspension. It had, uh, it was quite a, automotively, quite a good chassis, but uh, this turret and gun ruined it. The gun is what we called the 20 pounder in those days. It's about 84 millimeters caliber. And it was a very powerful anti-tank gun. But in this thing, in this mounting, absolutely useless. Now you could say that Charioteer was a tank destroyer, like the American vehicles, because they were often quite lightweight and designed to destroy tanks and uh, not worry too much about incoming fire. The trouble is that Charioteer's got a coaxial machine gun and with a coax, that's a, a machine gun alongside the main gun and anything with a coaxial machine gun is automatically a tank and they, these things were issued to the British Territorial Army as their only tank available to defeat the big Russian tanks. And they wouldn't stand a chance, but that's how it was done. And it's really the turret 
that makes it such an awful tank. And that's why it's on my list. But uh, I'll tell you a bit of the story about Charioteer. Apart from being seeing a bit of service with the Territorial Army, they were mostly sold abroad. Countries like Austria and um, Finland bought them. And they were supplied to the Lebanon and Jordan as tanks. They weren't all that effective, but uh, in those days we didn't worry too much. As long as someone brought them and got them off our hands, we were quite happy got rid of the ruddy tanks and that was all that mattered. This one was actually kept as a sample and that's why we've got it at Bovington. We've since painted it up in the markings of the Arab Legion so it's shown as a Jordanian tank but it never was, it never left this country this particular one and um, it really is one of the most dreadful tanks that's ever been produced. They, one of the problems they found with it was that the, when they fired the gun, it produced such a huge, dense cloud of smoke that the commander couldn't see what he'd hit or fired at. So quite often, if he could manage it, the commander dismounted and walked to one side or the other to where he could see and had the fourth man, the chap who was sat down here, hauled into the turret and made the gunner. He fired the gun, he couldn't see what he was firing at, but the commander could. But uh, you're not supposed to do things like that with a tank, it's silly. But that's the sort of thing they had to do to make charioteer effective. And if the Russians had allowed us to do that, fine, but they wouldn't, of course. They had powerful tanks, they could knock out our tanks easily. And this was the easiest one of all to knock out. So that's really why I've elected to include it in my list of uh, the worst tanks. Now, Black Prince is on my list of worst tanks, and you may wonder why. You may think it looks pretty good, it comes at the end of the war, it's got a powerful gun, and you may think to yourself, well, this is crazy. But there is a reason, and I'll come to it in a minute. Black Prince was designed by Vauxhall Motors, which is why it looks very much like a Churchill. In fact, it was originally portrayed as the large Churchill before the people at Vauxhall decided to call it Black Prince. Um, I was going to say it may have been known as Black Prince to its friends, but it never had any friends, so I don't see how they could do that. But anyway, that was what they did. It's really a Churchill, but what they've done is made it wider and, of course, heavier because they wanted to get a 17-powder gun in. It's got the 17-powder Mark VI gun, coaxially mounted with a beezer on the top there on the turret, and a slightly lower front end. They thought that by lowering it they'd improve the driver's view. I don't really know whether they did or not, but that's what they were trying to do at the time. Now, the tank itself was pretty heavy to start off with. It weighed 50 tonnes, which was as much as really anyone wanted the tank to weigh at that time of the war, at the end of the war really. Um, 40 was considered heavy enough, and that applied to the later Churchills, but 50 was a little bit over the top, but they decided they wanted an infantry tank with a 17-pounder. They'd already got the A30. They were designing the Centurion, which had the same gun, but in a slightly better turret. So quite why they did built this at all, I've no idea, but they built six of them as prototypes, and this is the only one that's left. This is number four in the series, as you can see. Um, it's got a Churchill-type suspension, but running on wider tracks because obviously it's carrying more weight. But the armour is actually no thicker at its thickest than the armour on a number a Mark VII Churchill. It's 152 millimetres at the front, which is six inches, which isn't bad, but uh, they could have made this a lot thicker, a lot heavier. But the real reason why I think this is such a dreadful tank is because in the back, it's got the same Bedford the twin six engine as the Churchill. And when I said that, it's the same engine. It's the same horsepower, 350 horsepower, as you've got in a Churchill. Yet a Churchill weighs 40 tonnes and this thing weighs 50. And what they discovered, of course, was that 
that engine in a 50 ton tank would only drive the tank at 11 miles an hour, which is pathetic, really. I mean, even a Tiger could do more than twice that. But um, this thing could only do 11 miles an hour on a good day with a following wind. Uphill, it was even worse. So that was the one reason that I've elected this tank to be one of the most awful tanks we've produced. Why they didn't put a bigger engine in, I don't know. They reckon they could have put the Rolls-Royce Meteor in. The Rolls-Royce Meteor is 600 horsepower and probably would have driven this tank at about 22 miles an hour, which is quite respectable. But it would have meant installing the engine slightly leaning over. You'd have to do it at an angle because they hadn't left enough room for it and in, around the engine covers at the top there. But that isn't impossible. You could have done that and it would have worked perfectly well like that. But they didn't do it for some reason. And um, the, the thing goes with this old engine and nothing, nothing else in the back. We've tried to drive it, and you find this is exactly the same problem now. Even the gearbox is quite novel. It's a five-speed gearbox, whereas the original Churchill, or the, old, the Churchills, the seven and eight, had a four-speed gearbox. And with the gearbox, they found that they have five gears running pretty close together. And what they did was made sure that the driver changed gear quickly. If you change gear slowly with this weak engine pushing you along, the tank would stop in one and a half seconds. That was all it took to bring this tank to a grinding halt and you'd have to start from first and work your way through the gears again. So as you went up the gearbox, it was crucial to change gear quickly so that the tank still had some momentum when you got up into the next gear. And that's one of the other failings with it. But the real failing, and the thing that is hardest to explain, is why they fitted it with this idiotic old engine. The, Meadows, uh, the Bedford Flat 12 was really considered a bit out of date by then anyway. So why install it in a new tank? But they did, and that's why it's on my list of really dreadful tanks. It doesn't need to be that slow, but it is. This is number three, and I've chosen this because it's an amphibious tank. In fact, it's the only truly amphibious tank we've got in the museum. It's actually L1E3, the Vickers Armstrong amphibian that came out just before the war. And the reason that I'm selecting it for one of my most awful tanks is because it suffers in the same way as all these light amphibious tanks do from the conundrum if you like that in order to float it's got to be as light as possible which means very thin armor but in order to resist anti-tank fire it needs to have reasonably thick armor and it's a, a conundrum that they can't really sort out this particular tank actually has a hull of very thin armour inside and it's surrounded by these floats which are sort of kapok filled made of aluminium and they're supposed to keep it buoyant in the water. But really, the whole thing is a, is a joke of a tank. It's not bulletproof in any sense of the word, apart from with the revolver maybe for a while from a distance. but. Um, that's really what I want to show you, is the whole fact that all the amphibious tanks, although they seem to be incredible because they can go on land and water, are in fact almost completely useless. The other trouble with these vehicles is they're good enough at going on land. They're very fast on land, in fact. In the water, they're pretty good, and I'll show you why in a minute. But um, it's getting out the water they have a problem with. If they they can choose where they go in, but they can't always choose where they come out. And if where they come out is very muddy, they're likely to get stuck. If there are loads of reeds there, they're likely to get snarled up in them and not uh, climb up the bank. So that's always a drawback with all these amphibians. They're good enough on land and good enough in the water, but absolutely hopeless when it comes to getting out the water. Now, I'd like to be able to show you the amphibious nature of it. It's not that easy. But you've got the drive sprockets at the front on each side and the drive sprocket drives a shaft from each drive sprocket. The shaft goes back 
to the propellers. The propellers are in what are known as court nozzles. The propeller is surrounded by a rudder. It's like a, a tin shroud, if you like. And the two propellers go left and right, as you'd expect, and the rudder goes with them. So for steering, it's actually very effective in the water, but um, that doesn't really solve the issue, the fact that out of the water, they're completely and utterly useless as tanks. It's armed with a single Vickers machine gun, which is probably better than spitting at people, but only just. And that's on the side in this case, because we've turned the turret round. And it has a crew of two, a driver in the front here and a commander in the turret. But although it may look the part, it really is utterly useless. And you wonder why they bothered to produce them. This vehicle came out before the war, as I say, it was tested. They weren't really happy with it. They put it away while they had a war. They thought they'd sort of test it afterwards. And in 1945, it was dragged out again and started up and they gave it another test. But they never got any further with it. They only built the one. They never built more than one, thank goodness. And um, this is it. Just one really horrible and pointless tank built for, uh, for no good reason bar the fact that they could build it, I think. Um, and that's it, really. It's not a lot. It's powered by a Meadows engine, so it's actually quite powerful, but um, absolutely hopeless as a fighting tank, which is what they're really meant for. So it seems silly. Right, we're going to look now at the Covenanter. This is number two in my list, and it's done for a reason, because it is really an awful tank by general consensus as much as anything else. To start off with, the tank was built originally by the London, Midland and Scottish Railway Company, who weren't actually probably the ideal people to design a tank, but they had help from the Department of Tank Design. And oddly enough, I mean, it's such a good looking tank that it's difficult to see how it could be so awful, but it is. Originally, when it was designed, they decided to make it the first all welded tank. It was going to be constructed of armour plate, but welded together, so it didn't require any internal frame. Now, the trouble was that the LMS company, the railway company that was building it, didn't have welders, they had riveters, and they persuaded the Department of Tank Design to have the tank riveted. With riveting, you need a frame to rivet the armour too, and that immediately puts up the weight. The next problem was the wheels. The original idea was to make these wheels of aluminium alloy, because that was lighter. And they've discovered, to their horror, that the Royal Air Force had put an absolute ban on anyone else using alloys except themselves, because they needed it for aircraft construction. For that reason, the wheels are made of armoured steel. They're good and strong, but they put the weight up again. And in fact, by the time they'd finished doing all this, the extra framing and the extra weight of the wheels, they'd already reached the limit of what this tank could support as far as weight is concerned. And they did nothing towards putting that right. They just hoped for the best. It's powered by a horizontally opposed 12-cylinder Meadows engine which is in the back, of course, behind the turret. And it's got the radiators here at the front. We'll come to them in a minute. But first of all, the weight is the big problem. The fact that they designed it as a welded tank, gone over to riveting, and that had really ruined the tank to start off with. The rest of it, mediocre at the best. It was really too small. The thing was, the design was terrific, and this amazing selection of horizontal armour was tremendously good because you, the one thing you don't need is any vertical face of armour that will absorb fire. You want it as horizontal as you could get it. And with the hull, they'd done that, they'd made it almost flat all the way back. There's hardly a vertical face on it. With the turret, it's slightly different. You've got a vertical face at the front. But notice how the turret comes out at the sides. It sort of appears to bulge out. Now, the reason for that was because they'd lowered the, hell, the sort of headroom in it, 
They wanted as much room as possible for the crew to use their elbows. There's three men in that turret and they needed room so that if they moved an elbow to pick up a round or something, they'd have room to put it without banging the sides. That's why the turret's this weird sort of angled shape at the top. But the real mistake with this tank was placing the radiators in the front and the engine in the back. There are two radiators under this armoured louvre here and they're both there to cool the engine. Now the engine, as I say, is a horizontally opposed 12-cylinder by Meadows. Quite an effective engine in its own way, but you don't, if you're designing a tank at home, don't, for heaven's sake, put the radiator in a different place to the engine. It's just not meant to go there. The result is that you've got the radiator at the front and every single one of these tanks, when they left the factory, had a, a developed a serious cooling problem, usually with the radiator boiling or something like that. And it was all to do with where it was. They did try and remedy it. They kept trying to change it. They kept changing the layout of the cooling fans on top and everything else to try and make it you know, work a bit more reasonable, but it didn't. It, just continued to be a fault and it meant that of over 1200 of these tanks built none none at all were ever accepted for combat they were only ever used for training and that at a time when in this country we were desperate for tanks the Covenanter got pushed aside and became a training tank I've had it suggested to me that had we put a bigger gun in later on it would have made a good and quite reliable reconnaissance tank but really this is a tank designed in 1938 and it's got all the faults of a 1938 tank it just isn't fit for a battlefield of 1944 so that idea went out the window straight away the tank had a two pounder gun in the turret and that was all it was capable of carrying couldn't carry anything more if they wanted to so that was that but this is the real problem with this tank it's putting the radiator at the front, it meant that all the coolant, all the pipes carrying coolant, passed round the side of the fighting compartment. So that whatever the man leant out and touched, it was liable to scald him, because it was very hot. And it meant that the turret itself got very warm, which is okay in a cold climate, but not so hot in the desert. You don't want a warm turret when you've already been roasted by the sun. Otherwise, it's quite a, a reasonable tank. It's got a Christie suspension, it's quite fast, but its trouble is not always going to go very well. And when it breaks down, which this thing did regularly, it's nothing but trouble. They were originally going to put a full Wilson transmission in here, but that's something else they decided not to do. So the tank's got an ordinary crash gearbox, a Meadows gearbox, and then two um, bolt-on units of epicyclic drive by Wilson on the side and that's all it's got it hasn't got a proper sort of modern transmission at all and they, they had better ones available at the time so that's the Covenanter it doesn't look bad but it is it really was a dreadful tank not the worst not quite but nearly so and certainly as far as the army was concerned in the second world war one of the worst tanks of all because it was only fit for training. They were never used operationally. And that's a, a, a bad, a, quite an indictment by itself. Right, now what we're going to look at next is A38 Valiant. And this is the top of my list for tanks that are really awful. There is nothing in the whole tank museum more dreadful than this thing. And I mean that quite sincerely, but uh, we'll talk about it anyway. Um, for a start, it was designed as a heavy assault tank. It was designed to have 114 millimetres of frontal armour, which it's actually got. But it's such an ugly cast lump, as you can see, because it was built rather like the old Matilda II, with bolted together castings. But this thing here, this sort of moulded section, was an absolute trap for the driver. It meant that once the driver got in, he was in severe danger. For a start, if he moved the gear lever over to first gear, it got trapped behind the battery box. And it actually needed a crowbar to get it out again, which doesn't sound very ideal for changing gear. 
They also had an arrangement whereby to use the brake, he had to use his heel rather than his toe, and there was always a danger that his foot would slip between the two pedals. And one of the results of that was that if the foot slipped, he got trapped. Literally, the man couldn't get out. They said the only way really to get him out was chop his leg off, which doesn't sound all that healthy either. The third thing was that he has a seat which raises and lowers here. Now, the trouble with it is that in the raised position, it ends up with him sticking his head out of this hatch here and the back of the armour clouting him on the back of the head all the time. And they said that the only time they ever tested this vehicle, which was a suspension test, a cross-country drive, the driver got out after a while and said if he stayed in it any longer, he'd be crippled. And that was one of the worst things about it. But the whole design is awful. I mean, this huge turret, which is designed to take a six-pounder or a 75-millimetre gun. Also, although you can't see it so well from here, at the back, perhaps we'll get a close-up in later on, the back of it is only nine inches off the ground. And that really is too low. It means that the tank going over a bump is going to bottom on whatever it hits. And each of the suspension arms, it's based on the Valentine, really, built by, or designed by Vickers, but not built by them. The um, suspension arms are on wishbones, and each one is fed by its own pipe of oil and liquid to keep it going. And those bits and pieces underneath the tank are likely to get wiped out when it's going over any sort of rough ground at all. So it means if this tank is travelling over, say, gorse or anything like that, the chances are half the suspension is going to be ripped off inside, and that's not all that convenient either. So all in all, it really is a dreadful tank. It's powered by a GMC diesel, same as a Valentine, but it's so much heavier that it's also chronically slow. So it hardly got a thing going for it, really, this thing. It really is a dreadful design. And as I say, the officer in charge of the trials called the trials off because the tank was so awful and made so many mistakes that he um, hauled the crew out of it and took them home and decided not to go on with the test at all. The tank is really unpleasant and uncomfortable to uh, travel around in. And that it was used after the war as an example, the, um, what was then called the armour school used to get a load of young officers and line them up. And then as a special treat, A38 Valiant used to drive past them. And they'd watch it go by and then it would stop. And their job was to go over it and find out how many awful things it had going for it. They've, there's no record as well, anybody found them all, but uh, there's quite enough things in this tank to make it absolutely horrible. And really, when you think that it was produced at the end of the war, it was actually built by Ruston and Hornsby Limited in Lincoln. But it was a vicar's design because it's based on the Valentine. And when you think that this is at the end of the war, we've made enough mistakes up till then. So why we came up with this dreadful thing, I've no idea. So here we are, it's the worst tank in the world as far as I'm concerned. And that is why I've elected it to be my number one tank. It's got all the faults that you can hope for in one vehicle and really is an excellent example of the most awful kind of tank you'll find anywhere. Right, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to YouTube and to support us on Patreon because we really do need that. It helps us a great deal. Thanks very much.